Good morning, St. Susie Baptist Church, and thank you again for giving me the honor and the privilege to bring God's Word as we continue to explore redefining success according to Jesus. Last week I mentioned that for years I was exhausted trying to gain my father's approval. Um, and I got that when I graduated as a medical doctor. Some years later, God was leading me, inspiring and challenging me to be willing to leave my medical career in Australia, to go to Kenya, get Bible college training to serve as a missionary, particularly in Africa. In my father's eyes, I went from a success down here somewhere. And we used to have lots of arguments, strong words against each other. And I freely admit, I said words that were not appropriate for a child to say to their dad. I contributed and escalated the conflict. I remember him saying something like, son, why are you leaving a prestigious, financially secure career as a doctor in Australia to become what? A beggar. You're going to go around churches, ask your friends, begging from people. Because he knew I was interested in joining SIM, and he was aware that SIM workers, we receive financial support. I suffered my the rejection from my father. And if that wasn't bad enough, people at church, including leaders at my church, were saying, why are you doing such a foolish thing, leaving medicine in Australia? We need Christian doctors. So such wounding, rejected by my dad, people at church, in my Pain, I cried out to Jesus, Jesus, am I a success in your eyes? How do you define success? Have you asked Jesus that? How does Jesus actually define success? And what I discovered that even some of the leaders in the church were not defining success in the same as what Jesus taught in the gospel. And some of these church leaders who were discouraging me from going to Bible college in Africa were actually succumbing to Wall's definition of success. I showed last week the list how the most people in the world and most Christians define success. So often, according to our possessions, we wrap up our identity according to the house we live in or we rent or the car we drive, our achievements, our appearance, our popularity. All these outward symbols of success. But whenever we do that, we suffer harm. Because there will always be somebody else will have more, bigger, better. Even if we start feeling happy at a recent purchase of a car, say, how long will that be? Well, till the next model comes out. Then we'll be discontented, suffering the never enough syndrome. Today, we'll focus on the two other definitions of success, and that is to uh, be God's child. So you'll see in this diagram, we looked at last week, how how to identify and refute worldly success, connect with the real Jesus, and then applying Jesus' definition of success, the three essentials. One we looked at last week was being God's children. Today, we'll focus on being kingdom-focused and giving generously, And how do we do that in community? The reminder, the biblical passage, uh, Jesus refuted worldly success when he said, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. And I alerted us with the question, Is greed a blind spot in our discipleship? And let me be clear, I don't when we say greed, the Bible definition is not just about money and possessions. I suffer greed when I compare myself with others who have more influence or who have achieved more, who have more honor. That could be my struggle with greed, the envy of what other people have. So it is often about money, but not limited to money. And the way Jesus taught about that was the parable of the rich fool, who was at the pinnacle of success, thought of himself as a lot of billionaires and millionaires think today, I've got life together. I can just take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. 
And at the point when he felt the most secure, he was actually most vulnerable. He was moments from his death and God's assessment. God said to him, you fool, tonight your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get all that you've stored up for yourself? Now, when I've heard sermons preached on this, it's almost as if Jesus is just talking about rich people. No, he's talking to all of us. Because he turns to his disciples, he also warns us, he said, this is how it will be with anyone, with whoever stores up things for themselves but is not rich towards God. How do we become rich towards God? How do we become a success in God's eyes? He says, don't worry about what you will eat or drink um, because your father knows you need them. He emphasized the relationship, being God's children. He went on to say, don't be afraid. Your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom and then sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The second essential then is to be kingdom focused. But that's most challenging because in Australia, we're caught in this whirlpool of self-absorption. The marketing in Australia, advertising, social media, some of the best and most powerful in the world constantly bombards us with messages, hypnotize us with messages that life is about you. You are the most important. And we start to believe it. And we start thinking, yeah, I deserve to be happy. Jesus is there to make me happy. Let's be honest and identify where we might be tempted to be self-absorbed. Where we get caught up with the comforts of life, our career, the lifestyle, our popularity or the pleasures we could afford, the mortgage and possessions. There's a man named Frederick Huntington who gave a warning. It is not scientific doubt, not atheism, not pantheism, not agnosticism, and I would add not Hinduism, not Islam, Buddhism, or any religions, that in our day and in this land is likely to quench the light of the gospel. It is a proud, sensuous, selfish, luxurious, church-going hollow-hearted prosperity. Francis Chan quoted this man, and he said these words in 1893 in England. He was already seeing how prosperity, comforts, will just dull our spiritual life and distracts us, and we start feeling independent from God. So what we need to do you see, if we get caught up with ourselves, it's like our Trotter diagram on the left. It shows that our lives is like divided and distracted because at the core, it's still self. And then we're after worldly success. Um, and out of that striving to be worldly success, then we're caught up with our achievements, lifestyle, all those things with the whirlpool of self-absorption. And then it's as if we try to add a bit more God into our busy life. And sometimes we interpret sermons as if, okay, I'm convicted, so I'll just increase my life, that, that segment of, of the kingdom. But most of our lives, we're just self-absorbed. It's just about me. Let me be clear then. I'm not asking us to squeeze a bit more of Jesus into our busy lives. It's got to be a transformation from the inside out so that at my core, it's not about me. It's about being God's child. I'm dependent on God, relying on his empowering so that I can be kingdom focused so that the circles on the right is an integrated and enthusiastic life because we're experiencing the power of Jesus. And then it radiates to all areas of our lives. So I don't define myself as a doctor or accountant, teacher, nurse, mother, father, or even any of these roles. 
I'm a child of God. I'm an ambassador of the King of Kings. I'm a steward. I'm a servant of the Most High God. And I happen to earn my living as a mechanic. Do you see the difference that makes? So I don't define myself according to what I do, whether I'm a janitor of a school or whether I'm a billionaire. The core identity, as we saw last week, being God's child radiates out, be kingdom focused and give generously. And all of my life then is in the God story because it's all about God. So the third essential now, just as most, just as challenging, and for some of us would be the most challenging, and that's about giving generously. But the most challenging or, or, or obstacle to giving generously is that sometimes we think we are already generous. Do you consider yourself generous? The average Australian considers ourselves generous because the Australian government keeps bragging about how generous they are. Hey, I'm an Australian, so if the government is generous, that must make me generous. But the harsh reality is that if you were to do the statistics, the average Australian gives about $1,000 to charities per year. But we waste, we throw away in food more than $1,000 per year. How could that be generosity? And it's because we define generosity according to how much we give. So would you define Bezos as generous when last year he bragged about giving $10 billion to the Earth Fund? And then we discover he manages the Earth Fund himself. And he didn't tell anybody else that he kept $150 billion or whatever to himself. So would God consider Bezos generous? Well, we need to overcome and we need to define generosity according to how Jesus defined it and not see ourselves as the owner of our resources, but as stewards. In Luke 21, Jesus redefined generosity. He he was in the temple back then. They had a huge chest where people would drop coins, and the wealthy would make a big fanfare, just like you know, the billionaires of today, huge social media thing about how generous they're giving. And Jesus watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Now, she could not have given her last two coins if she was not a daughter of God who practiced faith and dependence on God. And she was kingdom focused. That's the definition of generosity. So John Piper encourages us to refute delusions that we're owners, we're to give as a steward or as a channel of God's blessing when he says, the issue is not how much a person makes, you know, no problem with how much you make. The evil is in being deceived into thinking a $100,000 salary must be accompanied by a $100,000 lifestyle. Like he said, if God blesses you more, don't keep increasing your lifestyle to match your salary. Because God has made us to be conduits or channels of his grace. My hero is William Colgate. The more God gave him the blessings, he just kept giving away more and more. So by the time he retired, people who were close to him, he never bragged about it. But they estimated that he would have given 90% of his income. He reversed the concept of tithing. That's generosity. So there are three things then. Being God's children, being kingdom focused, and giving generously. And we, it's only possible if we do this in community. So the fourth and last point is redefining success in community. You can't do it alone. Sure, you might make some resolutions, last you four weeks, maybe a few months, but it is impossible to redefine success on our own. And therefore, exchange isolation or competition, it is challenging with lockdown not to feel isolated. And we can't meet in groups, in person. 
but do whatever you can to connect by phone, uh, Zoom, uh, WhatsApp, whatever ways to keep connecting, journeying together. So instead of viewing others as a competition or co keep comparing ourselves to them, seek to bless them and collaborate and be in synergy. So please do whatever you can to be part of a group where there's mutual support, prayer and accountability. And now as a last point, uh, let's look at how do we redefine success as a community of faith, as a church. And what I'm doing here is to, based on my observations, so you know, I want to be upfront and honest. These are just based on my observations, is that churches can fall to two extremes or small organizations. So I've been past, when I was a pastor, uh, the church started small, but five years later it was big. And I was national director of mission organization. So these are my observations. It, just for, because I want to explain the extremes, it might sound harsh. Um, my intention is not to offend but to push us hard to be honest with ourselves. So if you look at the, the, the way a pendulum swing, they go through extremes. And what we need to avoid are the two extremes. So my observations are on the, on the left. Uh, smaller churches or organizations, these are their struggles or temptations. And then on the right are uh, the temptations uh, that are for larger organizations based on my observations. On the right, are also if your experiences with the business world, you, you know, you're used to the corporate, sometimes you bring that into the church as well. Um, so smaller organizations tend to struggle with a false humility. Um, to say we're the faithful remnant to justify that we haven't been growing. It's because we're so solid. And, um, but then the result is a scarcity mindset. We worry so much. And then we're fairly passive. We, we say, well, we don't know what to do. We, we pray, uh, but we're not taking risk. Now, large churches, the temptation for them can be that because they're big, they take pride in their growth, in the numbers and facilities, uh, their brand or corporate image. Um, they have false security in their possessions and bank account, and sometimes they can come across as, as aggressive. Um, what I would suggest, the middle is the road less travel, is that we place our security and our identity as God's children. And that's why the pastor of, of the struggling church in the slums of Brazil or Bangladesh, in God's eyes, can be just as successful as the pastor of the mega church in the U.S. Because it's all about who we are. And then we're to be kingdom focused, giving generously. So the characteristics are there prayer, prayerful, and both faithful and fruitful. Uh, people caught up, get caught up about the argument about numbers. Well, numbers represent people, but they're not an end in themselves. But I also believe God wants us to grow and to be fruitful. And then that therefore we need to take risk because that's the journey of faith. We need to always be risk taking. Uh, the, the middle of the road is to be assertive and to confront failures or mistakes, learn from them, and then keep taking risks to keep learning and growing. Uh, another observation is that smaller churches or organizations, uh, sometimes they can get focused on tradition, their wonderful history. And if you analyze a lot of the conversations, a lot of the um, Thinking is about the past glory days and keeping the status quo. Or sometimes they become over-spiritual to almost, they're ignoring the trends of decline or that there are no young families or children or whatever. It's like they just live in their bubble of maintaining status quo. Big churches or organizations then, they could get caught up with the latest strategies, business marketing strategies, and they're all often on the latest things and they eventually becomes more like a production of the people. There's a lot of hype and, and show and glamour and they're under spiritual. The middle of the road is that as we are dependent upon God, then we exercise ministries that are holistic, both end. We are prayerful and we look around trying to learn from others. Good business principles are still good, they're still wisdom, 
but we require to be prayerful and to exercise wisdom because not what works out there will work here and so on. So we need to discern um, by listening, learning and applying the appropriate strategies. I believe in having a God-sized vision in dependence upon God. Another observation is that small churches or small organizations, um, they can also get caught up in being independent. Um, I don't know why. We, we, maybe it's because of our Western culture, you know, we, we're often independent. Uh, but sometimes then the temptation is to be inward looking to say, woe to me, we're, we're struggling. Um, and then we're critical of large churches. And so they must be unfaithful, they must be compromising, that's why they're growing and then resistant to try new things. Now, large churches, uh, they have almost the opposite, but it's the same independence, because they're independent, thinking we don't need anybody else, we're self-sufficient. Um, but they're still inward-looking, because we're saying, look at me. Uh, then they look down on small churches, and it's all about the image, and they can be very task- and result-driven, rather than people, about numbers. Well, what's the middle of the road, a balance to, to maintain, is that we need to be actually intentionally interdependent. Uh, we are part of an association of churches, as Baptist churches. Let's learn from other churches. Let's benefit. And if God is doing something in our means, let's share it with others. Um, and that's what we, we need to be doing, to be generous. Because there will always be someone else who we can help. And when I say that, don't just think about Australia, think about beyond. I have friends who are pastors in Kenya who for nine months now haven't been able to meet. And they don't have internet. They can't do have online services. They're really struggling. So we need to think of the sisters and brothers globally and to serve people outside of the church. So when I say serve people outside of the church, I don't mean just outside in our locality and community. We need to do that and beyond. Uh, to the ends of the earth, as Jesus said. So in summary then, how do we maintain that balance, avoid these extremes? One of the key is our leadership teams. Uh, we need to be honest, where do I tend to fall? Sometimes it's based on my personality. I tend to fall on the syndrome of the large churches, partly because I have been part of a large church. I can be overly ambitious for the wrong reasons. So I need to acknowledge where do I fall in this extreme and are there other people in our leadership team who can balance and do they have equal voices? And we need to be deliberate in acknowledging where we fall in these extremes and how do we be, be in unity while we have diversity. Well, one of the keys is that to keep focusing on um, being God's children, so it doesn't matter if I'm wealthy, I don't get a louder voice if I have more money, not in God's kingdom. It's all about being God's children, kingdom focus and giving generously. Um, and at the end of the day, we need to be de dependent on God and interdependent with one another. So I hope uh, there are some of the ideas that is to apply redefining success according to Jesus as a community of faith. To sum up then, the, the last week and this week, worldly success is, might look good on the outside, we might be comfortable, wealthy. The warning is that we could actually be poor towards God. Jesus' success is to be rich towards God. Sometimes the more success we uh, attain, we can become more rebellious, live like orphans, independent of God. Whereas True success in the eyes of Jesus is to be a child of God, to be dependent on God. Even when you have a lot of wealth, if that's all your life, what your life is about, you still will have anxiety and fear and restlessness, the never enough syndrome, that becoming self-absorbed. And then when we struggle with envy or greed, we'll be stingy. We still are accumulating. Why not exchange that for Jesus' success? where as we celebrate being God's child, being kingdom-focused, we can experience his peace and contentment, courage, community. So instead of competition, comparison, 
we can experience genuine community, and then we can be overflowing with generosity, giving generously. As I mentioned last week, all this sounds easy in theory. The challenge is to put it into action. And this diagram shows the reflection and the action is that we need to keep putting it into action. So if I truly believe that life is about the kingdom, what do I invest my time in? What do I invest my money in? Where do I place my security, my identity? And to help all of us, I've, I will be starting an online challenge uh, seven weeks. Of course, you can buy the book and read the book. If, if Now that we're on lockdown, if you'd rather to buy the ebook, go to redefiningsuccess.com.au and um, you can purchase uh, an ebook there. Um, or help us to get the message out, share when, whenever we get live on Facebook and all that. Uh, help us share and recommend, buy the books for others. And you can join an online challenge or Bible study starting August 19th on Thursdays. Uh, and then uh, we're doing it the same thing again on Fridays. So, so two time uh, to accommodate for um, the different time limit, uh, time zones, to accommodate as many people as possible. So even with lockdown, you can watch it from home and, and then have the discussions. This, the emphasis will be on application and, and discussion. Or if you are somewhere where you can meet in person, you still can meet in person, watch it and then pause and then discuss it in person. Let me finish up then with the motivation. Why bother? I've alluded already that, that redefining success according to Jesus is most challenging. We've got to fight the whirlpool of self-absorption. Other people won't approve of us. We'll think we are losers. We think we're failures. We get left behind. That's the reality. So why bother? Please remember to avoid being motivated by guilt or by fear because that will not last long. The only motivation that will last through the hardships, through the challenges, is the motivation of love. Love for God and love for people. And I'll close with this story. When I was first heading off to Africa, my friends wanted to give me a good farewell party, and at that time, uh, in downtown Sydney, there was a fancy hotel that had a chocolate festival. My friends knew I liked chocolate, and so they paid for me. It was expensive, uh, and you come into a huge ballroom with all these tables lined with everything chocolate you could imagine. You know, those um, parfait, cheesecake, ice cream, those liqueur-scented chocolate. You could have as much as you like, and I did. Eventually, I had to go to the bathroom, and I passed by another hall where there was a signboard, a medical conference with the speakers listed, and while I was washing my hands, two doctors walked in talking about the conference, and I had these deep thoughts. You can enjoy this lifestyle, not because your friends paid for you. If you stay as a doctor in Australia... You'll be invited to conferences like this in 7, 10 years. Anyway, stay as a doctor in Australia 10, 15 years. You'll be earning a lot of money. You could easily afford to go to hotels like this for your holidays. You're giving up this lifestyle, throwing it away. What for? Is it worth it? I mean, that was pre-COVID, you know, but I, washing my hands with those deep thoughts for so long, by then I think they were sterile. I could have done surgery. But I began to realize that was the wrong question. True, I have given up that lifestyle. I can't afford to stay in hotels like that now. But why did I give up that lifestyle? It wasn't because of an it. It wasn't for my church or SIM. So when you are suffering, when you feel exhausted trying to fight the whirlpool of self-absorption, Please remember, the question is not, is it worth it? The question needs to always be, is he worth it? Is Jesus worth that much? And I had one of those rare experiences. I see if the Lord Jesus walked into that toilet and asked me, Omar, am I worth this much to you? The presence of Jesus felt so real, I almost cried, and I wanted to shout, yes, Jesus, 
You are worth this much and much more because you died for me. Paul puts it best in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, 15. For Christ's love compels us, motivates us because we're convinced that he died for all. That those who live, those of us who've received this gift of life should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us and was raised again. Jesus is worthy of my entire devotion. Jesus is worthy of to be worshipped by people of all nations. Join me in redefining success according to Jesus and bring glory, joy, delight, and honour to Jesus. Will you stand as we close in prayer? Our Father, how good it is to be able to call you Father. And sometimes, Lord, I'm reminded that throughout this world there are billions of very devoted people, but they cannot imagine calling the God Almighty Father. You have rescued us. And it's not that we're any more devoted than people of other religions. We thank you that you rescued us from our darkness our rebellion, ourselves. And now you want to keep working in our hearts and minds, our spirits. We want to cooperate with you and we ask you to continue to transform, to transform us from the inside out. That at our core, we might be about being your children and then to be kingdom-focused and to be giving generously. Father, we do acknowledge our inadequacies and helplessness, and so we want to cry out to you for your help. And as community of faith, we want to ask you to help us too, to be the light and to be the salt that you want us to be, despite lockdown, despite challenges and adversity. And so to all of us, uh, let's remember, it's Jesus who has empowered us. He has said to us in Acts 1.8, and will you receive his empowering? Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in your Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Let's continue to be Christ's witnesses. Father, we commit one another to your grace through this challenging season. And would you keep stretching our minds and our spirits that we might fix our eyes on Jesus, who is with us, the author and perfecter of our faith. And would you help us to keep encouraging one another, keep us connecting with one another, that no one would be isolated, but that we could be supporting, encouraging, and praying for one another. We commit all of us to your grace, Father, your peace and your love. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, and have a good week as we continue to redefine success according to Jesus.